This is Cruise Radio. I cruise a lot and I always sail with travel insurance. You should too. Get a free quote today at tripinsurance.com. Broadcasting from the tripinsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. This is Cruise Radio. Cruise Radio. Hey, how's it going? My name is Doug Parker. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Cruise Radio, a review of Royal Caribbean's Jewel of the Seas this week. Staff writer Richard Sims waiting in the wings for cruise news. I say waiting in the wings because when I put him on a hold, there were birds singing in the background. I guess he's working on his back porch today or something. Also uploaded a new video of the Carnival Venezia, a full ship walkthrough on the Cruise Radio YouTube channel. You could also find Cruise News Today there. That's every Monday through Friday. All right, staff writer Richard Sims is on deck. Hey, Richard. Hey, Doug. So it's official. Cruise taxes have officially been passed on to the guests. Ah, what a surprise any charges being passed on to the guest. I wrote a story a while back. It was like several years ago in which a couple of the big wigs in the Bahamas were very openly saying, we want more money from the cruise lines. We want more money from the cruise passengers. Y'all are coming here. But like, for example, NASA people, you're coming here, but people aren't getting off the ship and they're not spending money. That was a big, big complaint that they had. Um, Eventually, the Bahamas kind of took some of the responsibility for this, acknowledging that, you know, maybe NASA wasn't exactly doing the most it could to get people off the ships and spending money. So they invested a lot in improvements made to, you know, made made to the port of Nassau. And and they're also making improvements in Freeport, the various various Bahamas ports, in an effort to get more people off the ship and spending money. But, But But, of course, they have also found another way to make money, which is the port taxes that we all pay. So now they are increasing the port taxes charged for each and every guest on every ship. And remember, you pay these taxes whether you intend to get off the ship or not. It's not like you can sign something saying, I promise I'm not going to get off in Nassau, so please don't charge me the tax. Every person on the ship pays the tax no matter what. Uh, The taxes are going up on January 1st. Um, They originally were going to go up sooner, but the cruise lines kind of got together and said, hey, give us time to implement this. And so they pushed it back a little bit. But already guests are starting to get letters informing them of this and that the change is going into effect. And you know, how much you will pay varies because it sort of varies on a lot of things. It depends on the size of the ship. It depends on where you're going. It depends on, you know, how long the ship is going to be in port, all of that. But when you hit that purchase button on your cruise purchase and they, you know, at the last step, they always add in that the port fees and taxes and stuff. Well, that number is going to jump more than it used to. So be prepared. It's worth noting that we've always paid for cruise port taxes, but it's a funny place to be for the people who've already made final payment and are having to shell out additional tax dollars to cruise. Yeah, very much so. So it'll be interesting to see how various cruise lines handle that. Next up, man, we're having a crazy year with people falling and jumping off cruise ships, huh? Yeah. You know, the latest incident happened on the Carnival Elation, which was on its way back to Jacksonville following a four-day Bahamas sailing. So This is not one of those situations where we don't know what happened. We know to a certain extent what happened because there's video footage that appears to show that the man, it was a 30-year-old named Jalen Hill, that he jumped overboard when the ship was about 95 miles off the coast of Florida. He was was reported missing a few hours later by his travel companion. Uh, The Coast Guard did an extensive search, but they eventually called it off. They were unable to find him. Now, in a lot of cases like this, when there's a man overboard, the ships are involved in the search. And it can, you know, it can span many hours. Um, But in this case, the ship was basically told, no, go back to Jacksonville, you know, continue on. It was the last day they were heading back to Jacksonville into port, and they were told to go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm guessing this is, this is sort of an educated guess, but I'm assuming that the reason that that was, and that the ship was not sort of pressed into service here is two things. One, how much time had passed between when the person went overboard and when they were discovered missing. And two, the fact that it was sort of, um, relatively close to shore. This wasn't something that happened, you know, out in the middle of the Baltic Sea or something where the cruise ship was the only thing there and it would take the Coast Guard quite a while to get there. Mm -hmm. Because it was only 95 miles off the coast, the Coast Guard was able to very easily get there very quickly and do the search and take over. And, you know, so they didn't necessarily need to press the ship into service. Now, again, that's that is me 
guessing, making an informed guess based on how these things have played out in the past. But that certainly seems to be the case. Unfortunately, the Coast Guard was not able to find the man. So, you know, um, it's it's his fate is still up in the air. But again, it was someone who jumped, not, you know, not fell, as they like to say. Carnival's next cruise ship reached a milestone. We are often reporting that this ship or that one is delayed during the construction process and it throws everything off and people who were booked on the inaugural wonder, oh my God, is this going to like cause my, my cruise to be canceled? Well, in the case of Carnival Jubilee, we have good news. She actually had her float out a day earlier than expected. The ship was supposed to float out on Saturday, but they moved it to Friday because they knew some bad weather was heading toward the shipyard in, in Germany. So the ship did it, the, you know, the whole thing where it first touches water and has its float out. They did it a day early. At this point, the ship, which is the last of the Excel class, um, it's starts getting all the bells and whistles, or should I say furniture and restaurants, as it prepares for the sea trials, which I believe are expected to take place in August. Uh, her maiden voyage out of Galveston is slated for December 23rd of this year. One thing that's really unique about the ship is that for the first time, Carnival has emblazoned the, the bow of the ship with the word Texas and a star that's designed to symbolize Carnival's commitment to the state in general and Galveston, which will be the ship's home port in particular. You know, Carnival was the, I believe Carnival was the very first line to sail full time out of uh, out of Galveston. So, you know, they have a real strong connection to this particular port and strong enough that they, you know, they say, if you, you know, what's the Beyonce song? If you like it, you should have put a ring on it. Well, Carnival likes it and they put a big old star on it. And big changes for a Norwegian cruise ship. Originally, the Norwegian Joy was built for the Chinese market, but when it was relocated to the U.S., they did like $60 million in upgrades because there were certain things that the Chinese market wanted that would not float, so to speak, with the American market. So they did a whole bunch of changes. Now, um, they are actually making changes to the ship again as it prepares to move. Ironically, one of the upgrades the ship got back in 2019 when it went from the Chinese to the U.S. market was they expanded the observation lounge. They made it this like, you know, big, gorgeous observation lounge that was very, very popular. Now, they're actually during the the dry dock it's about to go under undergo they are going to reduce the size of the observation lounge in order to make room for more staterooms they're going to add about 60 staterooms there will be 24 more balconies and they're adding 40 spa balconies the later of which will have um direct access to the mandara spa now why that's important is because they are also ditching two of the sort of um four fee things that they had on this ship. One is the laser tag arena. They had a very big, very fancy laser tag arena on the top of the ship. And the other is the galaxy pavilion, which is one of those virtual reality things where you go in and you pay to play the various virtual reality games. Those are both being removed and in their place, they are going to be putting a nice thermal spa. So again, we go back and we look where they're adding 40 spa balconies, those will have access to the thermal spa, which, you know, I'm kind of surprised the ship didn't have a thermal spa, um, but now it will. Other changes are going to include an expanded version of the Vibe Beach Club, which, as we all know, is like one of my favorite parts of any ship. Um, and that is going to also kind of take up some of the space for what was eliminated elsewhere on the ship. Uh, it will be sailing. I'm trying to remember where it's going first. I know eventually it's coming to New York <laughs> because I'm very excited whenever a ship comes to New York and I plan to book on her when she comes to New York. Cause she'll be doing some sailings to, I believe Bermuda out of New York or maybe the Bahamas. Um, but where does she go first? I want to say Miami. Yeah, so it goes. Yeah. Yeah, Southampton to Miami, and then it's doing a season, I think, sailing Western Caribbean, and then it's going to reposition to Manhattan. Yeah, so um, big changes on this ship. And like I said, it's kind of unusual because it did undergo this massive $60 million uh, renovation in 2019. So here we go again. Uh, but in this case, they're taking away things that they added last time. And we first heard about this back in March, but passport processing times are still up there. The basic gist here is if you need one, don't wait. As of July, 
um, the average time is 10 to 13 weeks. And even with expedited service, you know, where you pay a little extra to get it quicker, it's still between seven and nine weeks, plus an additional two weeks for processing and mailing. So I don't know why they say seven to nine weeks plus two weeks. You know, why not just say, you know, nine to 11 weeks? I had to stop and do the math in my head there. I literally could not figure out seven plus two without using my fingers. They're hoping to get things back on track by 2023, but even that's not necessarily guaranteed. And there's one important thing to note, and it's something that doesn't get um, discussed a lot when we're talking about passports, and that is this. The State Department recommends that your passport be valid for at least six months after the date of your cruise. So let's say you're going on a cruise on January 1st, and your passport expires, you know, January 30th, and you're like, oh, that's fine. I've got plenty of time. I'll get it dealt with when I get back. No, no really, especially if you're doing a cruise to foreign ports. And the reason they do that is they are actually thinking of you, believe it or not, because they want to make sure that if something goes wrong, let's say you have a medical emergency and you're in you know, Guam and you have to get off the ship. I don't even know if ships go to Guam. You have to get off the ship and you are left there to deal with this medical emergency. They want to make sure that your passport is going to be good long enough to cover any reason that you might be in that foreign port so that you will have no issues getting home. So again, if you have um, a passport that is expiring, you want to make sure that it's good for at least six months after your cruise. All right, listener, question comes from Sylvia this week. Sylvia says, so something no one mentions or explains is the whole waiting on passports for 10 to 13 weeks. So I cruise twice a month and I need to send my passport off during renewal. So where does that leave me? Well, Sylvia, I have some bad news for you. That basically leaves you on dry land. Right. Um, first of all, the fact that you get to cruise twice a month is Really lucky, and all of us are very, very jealous of you. Let's just get that out of the way first. But yeah, that is that is a situation where you would actually be in a little bit of, of a problem. You're going to have to take a break at some point and give yourself enough time. Now, there are options. You can go to a passport processing center and, um, you know, and, and stand there and deliver the paperwork and pay for it and have it done right there while you wait. But they are, you know, they are few and far between. So you have to locate one, find it. You also cannot just show up. There was a time when you could, but now, you know, in the post COVID era or mid COVID era, whatever we want to call it, they, the state department does want you to um, call ahead, make a reservation, and then you show up and get it done. You can also pay services to do that for you. They will come, they will pick up your passport, they will take it to the passport processing center, deal with all of that. It is not cheap. Uh, in fact, Doug, I think you've dealt with that before, haven't you? Either you either hiring a passport processor or going to a uh, passport processing center. Yeah, so I've done both. So I was going to Vietnam right before the shutdown and uh, the whole passport has to be valid for six months thing. I didn't realize that it was expiring like the month after I got back from Vietnam. So I had to get a new one. I drove up to Atlanta and waited all day from like 730 in the morning. They handed me back at 430 that afternoon. I couldn't leave there or anything because you had to like just chill until they called your name or you'd lose your place. So I did that. Very simple. I had to just show up, but now you have to make a reservation, but it's the same principle still. And then also Matt, um, my buddy who came to Norway with me, he uh, realized after I bought the airfare for him that, oh, dude, my passport expires the week before we leave next month. So I'm like, all right, well, you're gonna, you're on your own there. You either go to Miami and go the same day from here in Jacksonville or use a service like Rush My Passport or one of those expediting services. I don't know which expediting service he used. I think it was Rush My Passport, but he had to pay the State Department's fee of um, whatever it was, like to get your passport, also like a $60 expediting fee he had to pay. And then he had to pay an additional rush my passport fee, which I think their service is like $400. So he was like maybe 600 bucks into it at this point. With that said, he did get it back here in Jacksonville within three business days. I assume that after he made that announcement, once the tickets had been paid for, there was some slapping of the head involved before you sent him off to get his passport. I told him I have no more financial responsibility. And if he wants to go to Norway, figure it out. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, we had a lot of passport talk this week, so hopefully we've um, saved some people the problem of dealing with these exact same situations, which do come up more often than you think. I mean, how often have you been at the cruise terminal and you see somebody like, you know, I didn't know. Well, listen to cruise radio and you will know. You know, for the past, gosh, two decades, my passport has been in the same exact place. It never moves. Uh, A couple of days ago, I went to check in for my trip to Venice in a couple of weeks, and it wasn't there. And you know that feeling you have, like, when you leave your cell phone in a cab in New York City and your heart stops? That was me. Oh, that's mean. (laughs) That's mean. Why uh, did you do that, though? You've had it for – you've had it in the same place for all this time. Why suddenly – I don't even have an answer. One last quick note on passports, Um, and this is something a lot of people don't know. Most people go and get the traditional passport. You can also get a passport card, which is the same thing basically as a passport, although if you get – like I have both a passport and a passport card. I assumed they would have the same number. They do not. They have separate numbers, but – The great thing about a passport card is you can put it in your wallet. It's about the size of a license. In fact, I use it whenever I need ID because I don't drive. Um, It fits right in your wallet. It's it's so convenient. And the great thing is, let's say you're in port, um, any port, you can leave one of them in your pocket, in your wallet, your purse, whatever, and leave the other in the stateroom. So even if you lose the one while for some reason, or if you get robbed while you're on shore and they steal your wallet with your passport card in it, you still have a passport on the ship. Although you are limited to where you can go, you can't go anywhere in the world with that passport card. You actually need your physical passport, but yeah, good tip there. Good tip. All right. Staff writer, Richard Sims, as always, thank you. As always, glad to be here. Have a question or a comment for the show? Send an email or voice memo to Doug at CruiseRadio.net. A big question we get at Cruise Radio is, how do I know if I need trip insurance? Simple answer. If you're getting on a plane, taking a road trip, or getting on a cruise ship, you need to have travel insurance. Hey, it's Doug Parker for my friends at TripInsurance.com. Not not only does TripInsurance.com protect your vacation investment, but it also gives you peace of mind in case anything were to go wrong on your trip. How do they do it? They offer three different types of trip insurance policies. Good, better, and best. One policy for every vacation budget. But it doesn't just stop there. They're up to 40% lower when you shop around on other comparison sites. Plus, TripInsurance.com offers 24-hour customer support before, during, and after your trip, online claims assistance, and travel alerts to let you know what's going on at your destination. But find out for yourself. Check out TripInsurance.com. Have a question or a comment for the show? Yeah! Send an email or voice memo to Doug at CruiseRadio.net. John just returned from an eight-night sailing aboard Royal Caribbean's Jewel of the Seas. It was a Southern Caribbean cruise out of Port Canaveral. He joins us on the line. How you doing, buddy? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, good to talk to you again and excited to hear about this eight-nighter out of uh, Port Canaveral. Jewel's here for a little bit here in Central Florida. So before we get to the ship itself, you're out on the West Coast. What made you want to take this eight-nighter out here? Well, I typically take the navigator of the seas because I'm loyal to Royal, and we finally got a ship back in California. However, many West Coast cruisers may agree with this. One of the problems is we don't have a gazillion different Caribbean islands, so you go to the same three or four ports all the time. You go Mm -hmm. to Ensenada, you go to Puerto Vallarta, Mazatlan, Cabo, Catalina. So I decided that I wanted to go to different destinations, so why not go to Orlando and pick up the Jewel of the Seas and check out the Caribbean? Give me a local take on Catalina. I mean, you're out there close to L.A. Or, or, would you go like for the Saturday? I'm going to go to Catalina for the day. Or is that something like, you know, just tourists go out there or the rich or whatever? If you live in Long Beach, it's easy because there's a ferry that will take you there. Mm-hmm. Um, the the little joke in California is everyone claims to have a view of, of Catalina from their house. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like five people actually do, but everyone claims to. Like, are you sure it's not Japan? <laughs> um, but I think I've been there just a couple of times. It's neat, but it's small. You know, it has a neat history. They used to have baseball spring training out there. In fact, yeah. um, the Cubs used to do it. Mm-hmm. And Ronald Reagan was their broadcaster yeah. when the Cubs were out there. I got a kick out of my last cruise out of Long Beach because I was eating dinner in the main dining room. It was like around 5.30 probably or 6 o'clock, the early dining and Catalina is outside the window already, and that's our stop for the next day. 
So I'm like, oh, really? We're doing this? We're just going to throttle it way on back in circle until we can uh, <laughs> turn the slot machines off. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. So you, you make your way, you make your way over here to Florida. How was the embarkation aboard Jewel of the Seas? Easy. The hard part about Port Canaveral is getting from the airport and the city to the port. It's about an hour away. It's mm-hmm. very similar to Galveston and that relationship to Houston. But once you get to Port Canaveral, everything there is geared towards the cruise audience. So they know what they're doing, and you don't wait in line very long. They get you on that ship lickety-split. So what what, uh, transportation option did you take over from the airport? I rented a car, and it was very easy getting there, very easy dropping the car off, shuttle service nonstop. That was no problem. The problem was when I rented a car to go back to Orlando, the entire state of Florida descended on the Alamo rent a car. Oh, boy. And it took four ever to get a car, forever to get a car. Because it's one of those areas where a lot of people get the car somewhere else and just drop it off there, or they pick up a car there and they drop it off at the airport. Mm -hmm. So the supply of rental cars isn't always something that's static. Does um, Alamo do the, just you land and you walk down the aisle and pick your car, or was it just they were so busy that they couldn't offer that? They were totally overwhelmed, a complete mob scene. Interesting. Um, And they were doing the best they could, but it was just way more customers than than people working there. You make your way on board Jewel of the Seas. What were your impressions? I love the Radiance class ships at Royal. It's not the biggest ship in the fleet. It's not the smallest ship in the fleet. But it's one of these cruise ships that gives you a traditional cruise experience. The schooner bar is always my favorite place to hang out on a royal ship. And the schooner bar on the Radiance class ships on the Jewel is humongous. And it's nautical themed. And you have expansive views of the ocean. When I'm on a cruise ship, I don't want to look at pieces of art or a wall. I want to look at the ocean. Mm -hmm. And you really have tremendous opportunities on the Jewel to do that all over the place. What kind of stateroom did you book on this eight-nighter, and what did you think of it throughout the week? You know, typically I get a a junior suite or a balcony. This one was a casino comp, and it was for an interior room. And so I got that, and I figured, okay, I just royal up and try to get my upgrade that way. But the ship was totally sold out, so there was no opportunity for that to happen. But the room itself was fine. It was at the end of the hall. It was very quiet, and I had no problem with the room. So two things, Royal Up, like did you throw money down and just didn't get accepted, or was it not available? Yeah, you just make a bid, Mm -hmm. and you put your number in. They kind of give you an idea as to what people would usually pay for it. And then if you are the highest bidder and they have someone cancels at the last minute or a room becomes available – They'll go to whatever the best offer is, and they'll upgrade you. But this time around, it wasn't successful. Okay. And not to get too personal here, but casino comp. Now, is that something where you're throwing, like you're getting these offers after you throw a, a few grand in over time, or is it could it just be random? Well, I am a chronic gambler, so there's okay. that. <laughs> um, but Royal, actually, of, of all of the cruise lines I've cruised on, they probably have the best casino program in terms of comps. Mm -hmm. that's out there. You really don't have to gamble that much to start getting offers from them. The other thing that's great about the casino at Royal, and this is not widely known, but for the people that that know about it, it's it's a great little perk. If you cycle through, I think you need 2,500 points in the casino, you get free drinks in the casino, Mm -hmm. unlimited alcohol. And that works whether you're gambling or not. So if you're Diamond or Diamond Plus and you have Prime or one of the better classifications in the casino, then you have unlimited boobs anytime that casino bar is open. So if you hit 2,500 points, are they going to come tell you that or is that something you have to know going in? Well, I mean, they will just print it on your on your card. So if you hit 2,500 mid-sailing, go to the casino host and tell them that you want them to make you a new card okay. and they'll turn the drinks on right then. Nice. Very cool. Let's talk about dining on this uh, eight-night cruise. We'll start at the top at the Windjammer Buffet. What were your thoughts and impressions of the Windjammer? This is my favorite Windjammer in the system for the same reason that I love the uh, Schooner Bar, and that is because you have the option of eating outdoors there at the the back of the ship. And so you can eat your, your buffet food and you can look at the ocean. On sea days in particular, it is it is a great place to have breakfast. 
And breakfast was the only meal I, I ever ate in the Windjammer, mm-hmm. and it was really good. Is there any outside decks to the Windjammer? Like, is it located in the back of the ship or the front? I'm pretty sure it's the back of the okay. ship. But yeah, there is, there's a whole outdoor component to it. Mm-hmm. And a bunch of tables out there where you can, um, you know, just bring out your lunch. A lot of people during the day when, when it's not like a very busy meal time, yeah. go out there and they play cards or dominoes or whatever. You bring your dominoes with you on the sailing? No, I was in the casino. In fact, the only reason I brought sunglasses on this trip was to make sure no one could see if I was bluffing. <laughs> oh, gotcha. How about the main dining room? What time dining did you have and how was the food? Okay, so this was something I was paying pretty close attention to on this ship because this was, I believe, the first week that Royal brought out the new menus. One of the things that they're doing as a company is they are trying to streamline the menus in the dining room to speed up the service so you're not in there for two hours and to make sure that the food is hot. Because a lot of people complain about the temperature of the food because by the time it gets to them, your steak is cold. And so instead of having all of the like the spaghetti bolognese and the steak and the, and the baked chicken and all of these things that used to appear on the menu every night, they removed that from the menu entirely. And each night they had different options and many of those, those dishes would appear on the menu, but you had limited options, but it worked really well. They got us in and out of that dining room in a little over an hour every single night. And the temperature of the food was piping hot eight out of eight nights. So I know a lot of people are complaining about the changes to the menu. And they also now limit you to one lobster tail, which I thought was fine. Mm-hmm. Also in an effort to, to speed up the service. But being in and out of there in a little over an hour and having great hot food is the way to go. So any specialties? You said you ate there eight out of eight nights, but like maybe during lunch or anything? No, I didn't because yeah. on the last cruise I was on, I had the unlimited dining package. This ship only had, I think, three different specialty restaurants. It had Izumi, it had Chops, and it had, um, I think it was Giovanni's Table or one of the one of the Italian restaurants. And so because the options were limited and because I just did it, I figured I'd want to, I wanted to try out the new menu in the main dining room. I haven't been on a on Jewel of the Sea since 2011, I think. So is I can't remember. Is there a like a Sorrento's on there or anything like that? A pizza place? No, they have the carving station in the solarium. So instead of having the the pizza place that's open 24 seven, you can go up there and get like a roast beef sandwich anytime mm-hmm. they're open. It's not open 24 seven, but whenever I would get hungry in between meals or the middle of the day or whatever. I never had a problem getting a sandwich there. Or between hands, I guess, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. After a bust. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how about the entertainment on this eight-nighter? What would you think of it? Um, I went to two of the shows, and that was it. It's a little bit more limited on the smaller ships. They have a show at like 7.15 and one at 9.15, and it was fine. I mean, it was... It wasn't any of the, the Broadway musicals that you'd see on the Oasis class ships, and it didn't have an ice rink, so you didn't get an ice show or an aqua theater or any of those sorts of things. It was just the traditional cruise ship shows, and it was fine. Uh, nothing special, nothing awful. How about music around the ship or comedy shows or anything like that? Um, they did have a comedian on board. I did not go to the comedy show. I was in the casino. <laughs> um, but yeah, the the bars... Many of them had live music going on. It was great. They had that big atrium there um, when you get on the ship, and they'd, they'd have live music, a band uh, playing there, and that seemed to be a really popular spot. I'm not a fan of the trivia when they would put that out. It's just kind of loud and obnoxious, and I don't know that much about Star Wars. So right. uh, I would just grab my drink and move on uh, to a different different part of the ship when they'd start the trivia. I like a good trivia drama, though. Like if you're if you're walking by and someone has their phone out or something like that, and someone calls them out for it, like all hell breaks loose in the trivia arena. It's uh, it's worth seeing. It's, it's kind of that cruise you had over in what was it Australia, where it was a total like uh, a clown show at times. It kind of reminded me of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they take that very seriously. They'll cut you. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, so, how were sea days as far as crowds and congestion? Sea days were great. Oddly enough, and it was a sold-out sailing, I did not have trouble finding a chair by the pool. Now, truth be told, I didn't really go to the outdoor pool much. I pretty much stayed in the solarium. Mm -hmm. 
but I always was able to find a chair when I when I wanted one. Okay. Now, the, the solarium, is that adults only or can anyone go there? Well, it's supposed to be adults only, but okay. they really enforce that when they want to. Yeah. No. Um, but yeah, it's supposed to be, I think, 16 and older. And it's supposed to be, they don't have a, any bands in there or anything like that. It's supposed to be kind of quiet and serene. Again, sometimes they enforce that, sometimes they don't. But that's my spot at the pool. Does this ship have a diving lounge? It did. They have a diamond lounge and they had a sweet lounge. Mm-hmm. Um, both of them were up on deck 13 where the nightclub was. Yeah. And um, for a sailing that I, I believe had a lot of people with, you know, crown and anchor status, a diamond, diamond plus and, and uh, pinnacle, I always was able to find a, a table at the diamond lounge if I was up there. And with some of the ships in Royal they put the diamond lounge in what looks like a, like a conference room or something mm-hmm. where you have no views of the ocean. This one being up on deck 13 had expansive views of the ocean. So it was nice to get your coffee there in the morning or uh, have a little snack before dinner at night. How bougie is it in there? Like, can you get like a booze anytime the doors open or is it just like a five to seven cocktail reception? Well, they cut that out. So it's no longer the unlimited booze oh, okay. packet or the unlimited booze in the diamond lounge. And and that was wild. I mean, the entire ship would descend on there, and people, you'd see these 80-year-old women drinking like they were at a frat party. Right. <laughs> um, now what they do is they just load five drinks on your card if you're Diamond Plus, uh, which is what I am. And so you can get those from any bar on the ship. And so if you get a drink at the Diamond Lounge, that, that counts against your five. It's not like you get three passes up there. Gotcha. I do want to ask you just before we move to the ports of call, the casino, as far as the smoke situation in and around it, how was that? It was very, very, very smoky. Mm-hmm. This was a gambler's cruise because we went to the private islands and uh, different countries that allowed the casino to be open. Mm-hmm. So that casino was pretty much packed whenever it was open. And those people smoke like chimneys. Yeah. It doesn't bother me. I'm a non-smoker. It, it, it doesn't bother me if someone's smoking around me. But if that sort of thing is uh, bothersome to you, bring a gas mask. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. On this cruise, you hit Perfect Day, Labadee, St. Martin, and St. Croix. So uh, give us a port of call, a highlight. We'll move to the next one. Well, the first one was Labadee, and uh, that's their private island. I got off the ship. We had amazing weather on the island and just did a beach day over there. I didn't eat on the island, just had drinks and swam in the ocean, but it was not crowded. We were the only ship that was there that day. So we pretty much had free reign over over the island. Big fan of of Labadee. Have you ever done the uh, Dragon's Flight, the uh, zip line there? No, I haven't. But that was sold out. I actually looked into doing that. Mm -hmm. And it was sold out by the time I checked into it. Gotcha. But yeah, I, I love the zip line. I would absolutely do that. What was your next port of call? The next one was uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And we got there later in the afternoon. So I just got off, uh, went to a, a local bar, uh, had some, some snacks and tapas, a couple of drinks, did some shopping, and got back on the ship. Do you have a go-to bar you go when you hit, uh, hit up San Juan? Yeah, but I probably can't pronounce it. Okay. Well, yeah, don't do that because we'll get emails. Or I butcher it. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Is it walking distance from the port, though? You can get there like in a few minutes, right? At least 20 minutes? Oh, no. No? No, it wasn't walking distance. But it, it's the United States, so your Uber works, your Lyft works. Yeah. It's not difficult at all to get a car down there. and They're relatively inexpensive. So if you want to take a car from the cruise ship area and go to uh, the Cantado, where a lot of these bars and restaurants are, uh, it's not hard at all. You said it was the United States. It reminded me uh, I was there about a month and a half ago, and there was just an older couple probably in their, I would give them late 70s, early 80s, and the wife had her phone on, and she was on Facebook, and the husband's like, turn your phone off, Martha. We're in a foreign country. We're going to get charged. (laughs) And she's like, it's AT&T, Harold. We're fine. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, wow, make a scene. I hope well, y'all are on my ship. Cruise. Wouldn't be a cruise without a little domestic dispute. <laughs> exactly. <especially. laughs> you know, at some point. Uh, it's, uh, it was awesome. Okay, so after San Juan, where'd you go? After San Juan, it was St. Martin. And uh, typically what I do is go to the airplane beach, uh, Maho Beach. Uh, but that is like Hollywood Boulevard with the tourists. <laughs> right. So I decided that 
I would try the French side of the island this time. I'd never been to the French side of the island. And I did that and had a wonderful beach day over there and found out that apparently on the French side of St. Martin, they have phenomenal French restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a chance to sample any of them. But but after hearing that from some of the locals, some of the French locals who who live there part time, uh, next time I go there, I'm definitely going to be eating some French food. I guess it's like probably St. Martin with what half French, half Dutch is probably a uh, vacation destination for them to do holiday, right? Like from the Netherlands or from France, go over for a week. Oh yeah. They have nonstop flights nice. from Paris to, to St. Martin. Um, and I think they have it from, from Amsterdam too. And that Island was packed with um, Dutch people and French people who were escaping the cold and playing in the water. <laughs> have you been to Mahu when one of those, uh, one of those KLMs landed like the four sevens? Oh yeah, where it, it, they all when they take off, they uh-huh. throw the guy in the chair out of the water. Yeah, blowing blowing cameras and stuff in the ocean, and people are freaking out. That's always that was fun to watch too. So after uh, Saint Martin, where'd you hit up? Uh, Saint Croix was the next one, and uh, again, you're still in the United States. It's part of the Virgin Islands. There, uh, we did a day pass at one of the local hotels, which was fantastic. It was called Sandcastles, I think, and mm-hmm. it's. Uh, owned by a former American Airlines flight attendant. And you just buy a day pass. They have a beach, they have a wonderful pool, and they have one of my favorite cocktails that I've ever drank in the Caribbean. And I've never even seen it on a menu before. They have a pistachio daiquiri that is phenomenal. Nice. Okay. And so that was a the day pass. Did that include, like, did you have to get there yourself or was there transportation waiting for you at the pier? I walked there. Okay. It was maybe it was a close. 20-minute walk. Okay. So if you go there when it's not oppressively hot, it's totally doable. Mm-hmm. Um, you may want to bring tennis shoes because you, you do have to have a little bit of a hike. It's very close to the port. And I'll probably get an email on this asking, so when you went there, when you made your reservation, was this something you had to do in advance or can you just walk up and buy one? No, I just showed up. Okay. And there were many people from the cruise ship who were there. Gotcha. And um, we left. The call was call time was one thirty. So you you had to kind of do what you wanted to do there and get back on the ship because we didn't have a lot of time there. But um, yeah, a bunch of people from the cruise ship were there. And then your final port of call was what? Perfect day? Perfect day. And at perfect day, I took advantage of a Black Friday sale and did the uh, perfect day uh, beach club and uh, had a phenomenal time there. At the Beach Club, they have a restaurant where you get the filet mignon, you get the lobster, you get shrimp cocktail. They had a rum cake for dessert that had so much rum in it. If you ate an entire slice of that cake, you would be blown a point two by the time you got back on the ship. Oh, jeez. That's awesome. So this this beach club you speak of, though, is this something that you, you pay extra for and all like the, the lunch and stuff is included in the price? Yeah. And the price varies. It varies based on the day. It varies based on the ship. It's just an algorithm that's just entirely dependent on the demand. Mm-hmm. And I booked that way ahead of time when it was a Black Friday sale. So I think I paid $100 for entry there. Mm-hmm. And that includes your, your food and your, your beach chairs and all of that. There are people who were there who paid a lot more than that. So it just depends. It's like the water park there. No one pays the same rate. Right, and right. It, it just changes constantly. It's like a CNBC ticker, right. uh, the price on these things. When you see a deal, if you want to do it, jump on it. I find that these days it's kind of even hard to talk about what you pay for something on a sailing or your cruise anyways, because like I, and I learned this the hard way. I was eating dinner on Carnival Liberty about a year ago, and our cruise fare was $10 a person because Carnival was trying to fill the ship. And this person across from me asked how much we paid for the cruise. So we were like, oh, $10 plus taxes. It was under 100 bucks for the whole cruise. The guy's like, What? We paid $499 for an inside cabin. I'm like, oh, I will never tell anyone else how much I paid for my cruise because this guy was livid and was going to guest services. So I was like, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that. People who get a deal, they're just they're very coy mm. about what they pay. They're like, you know, Hollywood actresses when they're age. <laughs> right, exactly. No one, wants, no one wants to make the big reveal. Right. Uh, so you make your way back to Port Canaveral, the port for Orlando. How was debark? Uh, it was not bad. Um, they really have that down to a science. They had the the iPads that you that had the facial recognition software on it. So um, it was very, very, very fast. The problem was getting the rental car to go back to Orlando. 
Mm -hmm. Um, that's where all the lines were. And that was, that took a long time, but, but in terms of the port, Royal Caribbean and the people who run Port Canaveral, they know what they're doing. So let me ask you this, because like I always, I say always, I live like two hours from the damn port. But when I when I fly out of Orlando right from a cruise, I always just Uber there because it's like fifty, sixty dollars. Is, is there a benefit while you're actually renting a car? Like, are you tooling around Orlando or the Space Coast before you fly out? I was going with friends, and they got in much earlier than me. So they kind of wanted to explore Orlando. Okay. Gotcha. And so that was the primary reason that we did it. Coming back, we got the rental car because I went to Epcot Center on um, Sunday before I flew back to California. Mm-hmm. And so I needed a car in Orlando to, to get around there. But yeah, if it was me by myself, I would just Uber. Did you do Festival of the Arts? I saw it. Um, we did the drinking around the world. Okay. So well, I don't know how much I remember. But right. I saw okay. it. There's a there's a theme to this vacation for you. I see here. Um, very yeah. nice. So uh, any first time tips end to offer, up in a meeting, <laughs> right? Any, any first time tips to offer someone sailing Jewel of the Seas? What I would say is enjoy the views because they are all over that ship. The bars, the uh, pools, the Diamond Lounge. Everywhere you are, I know that, you know, the class below it is the vision class because they're supposed to have views. But Jewel has great views all over the place. Enjoy it because it's spectacular. Very cool. Looking back, your biggest highlight? St. Martin. Going to the French side of the island, something totally different than what I typically do. Mm -hmm. And uh, found out that it's great. And there's so much more over there I want to do. Did you have Wi-Fi on this cruise? I did. How was I it? did have Wi-Fi on the cruise. It depended entirely on where you were. So on deck 13 at the Diamond Lounge, you had no service. In my room, in the bowels of the ship, and again, I was in an interior room, so I was on deck three, which I, I was surprised they didn't make me row. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it worked fine in the room. So there was no rhyme or reason to, to where it worked and where it didn't, but it, it was just entirely dependent on where you physically were. Now, those interior rooms for for Royal on their older ships. Those those are pretty tight, though, right? The quarters. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, this is the first time I've ever stayed on Deck 3. Mm-hmm. And when I looked at my card and saw where I was staying, I thought they put me up in the COVID ward. <laughs> I remember my very first Royal cruise. And I remember, I you know, growing up and in my 20s, we'd always book interiors anyways. Like coming from Carnival, I think that they started like 185 square feet. And I think Royal starts somewhere like between 135 and 150 square feet for the interior rooms. If you had space issues or claustrophobia, you might want to think twice. Yeah, uh, it wasn't quite that. And I'm 6'4", so Mm -hmm. I I can feel like the walls are closing in on me very easily. I I didn't feel like uh, it was too small. Yeah, I mean, I would prefer a balcony room or a suite, but I was fine in the interior. Yeah, this was also Monarch of the Seas and Sovereign of the Seas. So we're talking like ships that were built in the, what, early 90s, I think, or late 80s, I guess, or somewhere around there. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what the, the Nina, the Pinto, the Santa Maria. Right. <laughs> exactly. They were the prototypes for that. Um, so uh, final <laughs> thoughts of Jewel of the Seas. It was a great cruise. I'm so glad I did it. It was worth the flight to go to the different destinations. And uh, I'm sad that they're they're moving it out of Orlando. I think it's going over to Europe in the spring. And then it's going to, I think, either do the Northeast or San Juan, something else. But it was a great sailing. Eight nights is so much better than seven. You have that one extra night. If you have an opportunity to do it before they move the ship, definitely do it. Take advantage of it. Been talking with John about his eight nighter on Jewel of the Seas. John, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. Thanks for having me. All right, Dougie, let's see what we got for you, buddy. Cruise Radio is produced at the TripInsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. Get cruise news, ship reviews, and money saving tips every Thursday on Cruise Radio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show. If you want to help spread the word, give Cruise Radio a five star review. Find Cruise Radio where you listen to your favorite podcast or online at cruiseradio.net. I'm your announcer.